Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Institute of Medicine's Crisis Standards of Care webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Friday, September 7, 2012. I would now like to turn the conference over to Jim Blumenstock, Chief Program Officer for her Public Health Practice at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Cersei. Uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. ASTO, in cooperation with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPR, and the Institute of Medicine is hosting this webinar to help you navigate the recently released Institute of Medicine's Crisis Standards of Care, a systems framework for catastrophic disaster response. Um, as all of you who are uh, planners, responders, and clinicians can clearly appreciate, um, the ability to rapidly and effectively transition from a conventional to a crisis situation um, is of paramount importance when it comes to um, human life um, preservation and safety. Uh, the IOM, um, which you'll hear over the next hour or so, has worked very hard um, to create sort of a second generation document that would guide us in this process of providing a, a wealth of information and serving as an outstanding resource to us. So it is our objective today to sort of give you the highlights and the, the most salient points of, of this guidance document um, that will basically uh, advise you and empower you uh, to use it more effectively and efficiently. What I'd like to do now is just briefly walk, uh, walk you through the agenda for the afternoon. Uh, we are so pleased to have uh, such an outstanding faculty assembled today uh, who I'll introduce in a few moments and give you a sense of um, what they'll be talking about. Um, with everyone's um, patience, what we'd like to do is allow the four presenters to actually share with you their prepared remarks, and then as Cersei had said, uh, we'll go into an open dialogue format where uh, participants can pose questions um, and the panels them, panel members themselves could react and respond accordingly. Um, you know, I know the individuals who are on today's faculty are no strangers to most of us on the call today. Um, clearly, we have f four listed, but there are actually five faculty members who are, are outstanding individuals, uh, highly uh, respected, and are doing such an outstanding job in really advancing and improving the nation's state of readiness and preparedness. So allow me to introduce them to you and give you a sense of exactly what they will be talking about. Uh, first, we have Dan Hanfling. Dr. Hanfling is the Special Advisor to the, to the Inova Health System in Falls Church, Virginia, on matters related to emergency preparedness and disaster response. Dr. Hanfling will then be followed by John Hicks. Uh, Dr. Hick is a faculty emergency physician at Hennepin County Medical Center and an associate professor of emergency medicine at the University of Minnesota. Next, we will have Mr. James Hodge, uh, who is the Lincoln Professor of Health, Law, and Ethics at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and the Director of Public Health Law and Policy Program and a fellow at the Center for the Study of Law, Science, and Technology at Arizona State University. And then we will um, close the formal faculty presentation uh, with Yamar Shah. Dr. Shah serves as the Deputy Director and Director of Disease Control and Clinical Prevention at Harris County Public Health and Environmental Health Services. Um, also allow me to introduce to you Dr. Bruce Altevoet uh, from the Institute of Medicine. Um, Bruce, along with the four other uh, faculty members, uh, have done such an outstanding job in developing this framework. So Bruce has graciously agreed to sort of be fifth man on the team, if you will, um, to support the presenters, but also to assist us in answering the questions and uh, having a very fruitful dialogue with you all when we get to that point in the program. So with that, it is now my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Hanfling, who will begin the session uh, by covering the introduction of the IOM's crisis standards of care. Dr. Hanfling. Uh, great, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks to ASTO uh, for the opportunity to participate with you on this uh, webinar. And hello to everybody out there in cyberspace. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. So uh, I'm going to kick things off by uh, essentially uh, focusing on the overview 
of some of the background leading to the development of crisis standards of care, and then uh, highlight for you uh, the salient uh, points uh, that uh, we developed uh, in writing the 2009 report, and then most recently this 2012 uh, report uh, that was uh, released in, in, in the end of March. And then uh, close out uh, my brief remarks by, uh, by highlighting the uh, direct li link between crisis standards of care and now what we see as a language in the uh, FEP and uh, HPP um, capabilities uh, grant guidance. So, <clears throat> and I'm sure that some of you have sat through these lectures uh, at the various meetings around the country, and so welcome back. Uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen uh, these presentations before, I hope that you'll find them useful. So let me start by uh, borrowing an old uh, part of an old slide from our colleague Eric Ofterhide uh, and adding to it uh, some updated information. Uh, and essentially what you have before you is a very arbitrary, somewhat uh, selective uh, listing of catastrophic disaster events in the United States. In this case, for the purpose of this slide, defining a catastrophic event as one in which a thousand or more casualties were generated by a single event. And the point that I want to bring to your attention is that from the mid-1800s uh, through the early ni uh, 1900s, uh, there were a number of events, uh, either large-scale uh, transportation accidents like the uh, Mississippi River steamship that went down or the uh, General Slocum, which went down in the East River of New York City, uh, or uh, Mother Nature, uh, like the forest fire in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, and the uh, floods and hurricanes that are listed, uh, all of which generated large numbers of casualties. And, um, <clears throat> and then, mysteriously, luckily for the United States, between 1928 and 2001, the attacks uh, in New York City and Washington, there were no events in the continental United States uh, in which there were large numbers of deaths or injuries. And uh, soon after the New York City and Washington, D.C. attacks, uh, we had Hurricane Katrina. So we saw not just terrorism, but Mother Nature as a terrorist. Uh, if you will, um, wreaking havoc and causing large numbers of death uh, and injuries. And I think that this is an important context um, to put these remarks into place because essentially we've done a lot of work collectively, all of us, uh, you and us, uh, over the last decade focusing on a lot of important issues like surge capacity and capability and public health preparedness planning and all of the things that we've been engaged in. But the fact is, is that for generations we were lucky and uh, we didn't have to contemplate these sorts of uh, catastrophic events. And I think that it in part explains why we've had so much work to do uh, in this short period of time uh, in the past uh, decade. Now, there's no question that um, Hurricane Katrina was really, I think, the galvanizing force uh, that really took our interest in looking at standards of care in disaster, really um, allowed us to begin to move this conversation from the back hallways and the water cooler to the uh, back of the room uh, when we used to present in the big conference rooms, now to the fact that we're presenting this uh, you know, as a sanctioned event uh, across the country, uh, you know, talking about uh, changes of standards of care in disaster events. And I think that within the Katrina event itself, there were a number of things that happened. Uh, first of all, the fact that, um, that some of our great health uh, healthcare institutions were laid, uh, you know, were laid to waste uh, as a result of the flood. Uh, were, was really a, a remarkable and uh, shocking uh, 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 outcome. Uh, this is a picture of the Charity Hospital in, in New Orleans, the place of so many uh, births and deaths and life cycle events uh, for the citizens of New Orleans, forever behind a chain link fence. And I haven't been down there recently, but I would guess that it is going to be dismantled if it hasn't come down already. And in addition to the fact that we lost infrastructure, we also really lost, um, we, we, we lost confidence in the ability, 
to, um, to deliver care and be certain as healthcare providers that we weren't going to be second guessed and as we know in the case of Anna Powell and her colleagues at the Memorial Hospital, be pulled up in front of a jury of peers, uh, in her case being accused of, of, of uh, criminal intent uh, with regards to decisions that were taken uh, in the worst of worst case scenarios. So, you know, I think Katrina really drove home the point that we have work to do around uh, assuring that these sorts of events don't happen to us again. I certainly don't want to have it happen to me or my colleagues, and I think you would say the same. So, so what, what, what has transpired? Well, going back to uh, the 2007-2008 time frame, uh, the federal government, the, 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 the um, the Department of Health and Human Services specifically began to look at um, how, how we might address this issue of standards of care and disaster. And uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, a, a, a depiction of the AHRQ uh, report on altered standards of care. And uh, by the way, you know, <clears throat> I'll remind you that uh, uh, all, we, we've gone through quite a number of name changes over the over the past uh, many years in looking at this issue of standards of care. And I always thought that altered standards of care was the way that care was delivered at Woodstock. But um, but regardless, we've we've gone from altered standards of care now to what we call crisis standards of care. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen, a June 2008 GAO report focusing on medical surge, but recognizing that allocation of scarce medical resources still uh, requires attention. So uh, in the academic community and in the professional community, there were other efforts that were uh, forthcoming. This, uh, a series of papers that was uh, sponsored by the American College of Chess Physicians and a number of us on this call uh, were participant uh, in, uh, in putting these monographs together. And so there really was uh, the beginnings of a recognition that, that, that conditions would change in catastrophic disaster and that the, the means by which care would be delivered would really have to uh, undergo some, uh, some, some sort of uh, shift. Uh, and so this was all well and good, and we were, uh, you know, considering all of this, a lot of it in the context of planning for H5N1 and the bird flu. And then in the spring of 2009, H1N1 happened. Uh, and this, a, um, a, a shot from uh, Mexico City uh, with uh, this uh, statue covered by ill-fitting masks. Uh, I would dare say those masks probably wouldn't provide too much protection. Um, and, uh, and in fact, the Institute of Medicine had been asked uh, by the uh, ASPR to conduct a series of workshops around the country to begin to um, test the waters and see just what sort of uh, work was being done, if any, around crisis standards of care or the, the recognition of, of standards of care in disaster situations. And we were actually in New York City at the fourth of four regional meetings when H1N1 started. And so soon thereafter, um, ASPR uh, requested formally of the IOM to put a committee together, uh, and I was uh, privileged to be asked to be the vice chair um, and to work with an outstanding group of colleagues. And in a very short period of time, in fact, no more than about two and a half weeks, we convened in Washington uh, in the first week of September 2009, and by the 24th of September, we issued a 120-page letter report uh, to Dr. Lurie. And it was focused on guidance for establishing crisis standards of care uh, for use in disaster situations. And in touching on the salient features of the report, uh, start with the ethical foundation, which was really focused on what we highlighted and emphasized as the duty to plan, the fact that, that, that as planners, it's really ultimately our responsibility to plan for these sorts of situations so that ad hoc, post hoc decisions like those that were taken by Dr. Powell and her colleagues uh, should never happen without some degree of forethought and foreplanning. Um, and what we did in the 2009 report was define crisis standards of care. 
as a substantial change in usual healthcare operations and the level of care that it's possible to deliver, it is, it is something that is formally declared by state government in recognition that the crisis operation is going to be a sustained event. In other words, it's not just busy Saturday night in the emergency department. It's not just your colleague wants to go get a cup of coffee and you feel overwhelmed with the patients you're responsible for. It's really a pervasive change in the way that care is delivered. And this formal declaration enables specific legal and regulatory powers and protections for health care providers uh, and recognizes that they will be allocating and using scarce medical resources and may, may even be delivering care in the out-of-hospital environment uh, using such uh, facilities as alternate care facilities and so on. And so this is really the formal definition, if you will, uh, of, of crisis standards of care. And the point to emphasize is that <clears throat> as we looked at the issue of delivering care, uh, we really uh, recognize that, that what we're talking about is expanding the ability to deliver surge capacity uh, and, and, and the capability required therein. And so uh, John Hick, who is uh, going to present to you uh, in just a moment, um, really helped to uh, help us think through the framework for looking at surge capacity and expanding the notion of surge capacity from just a sort of an arbitrary kind of one catch-all phrase of, of surge response to recognizing that surge capacity extends over a continuum and it ranges from conventional surge to contingency surge to crisis surge. And, and we looked at that and came up with the, with the concomitant recognition that really in a conventional surge response, you're likely to be practicing under conventional standards of care. And in a crisis surge response, you're likely to be responding under crisis standards of care. And that's really where the, where the name came from, and that's how we, we settled upon that, that notion. But the important point to emphasize on this slide is that as you shift from conventional to contingency, ultimately to crisis care, you are shifting from a patient focus to population focus. And this point was really driven home in January of 2010 with the uh, Port-au-Prince earthquake. And uh, <clears throat> that's actually uh, yours truly on the right-hand side of the screen, attending to uh, one of four patients who we pulled out of a collapsed university in Port-au-Prince uh, in the immediate aftermath of the, of the earthquake. And I'll tell you, it was humbling as as the author of the report, uh, as one of the co-editors of the report, but also as a practitioner in disaster situations in austere environments, to recognize just how difficult it is to transition from patient-based focus to population-based focus. It is not an easy issue. Uh, but the, the, the point to make, to make here is that on the tail end of the 2009 report, ASPR recognized that there really needed to be further elucidation of some of the principles and, and points that we highlighted in that report uh, of September 2009. And so uh, the IOM was asked to bring the band back together and to uh, reconvene the committee to look at crisis standards of care from a much more thorough perspective. And so we did and spent the better part of 2011 crafting the report that was uh, uh, written and released in March of this year, March 2012. And let me remind you that this is available to you for free uh, download from the IOM website. You can Google IOM Crisis Standards of Care. You'll have access to both reports. And it is uh, really intended to be uh, user-friendly as we will now uh, demonstrate to you over the, 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 the course of the remain, remaining part of this presentation. So the report is divided into uh, specific volumes. Uh, we have an introduction that uh, cross-cuts uh, and describes the overarching framework and legal issues. We address ethics and palliative care and mental health issues. And then we have four discipline-specific volumes that focus on the state and local government responsibilities, EMS, healthcare facilities, and out-of-hospital care. And I should mention, I'm remiss in not mentioning to this point that I've mentioned that ASPR uh, convened, uh, reconvened the committee. Uh, it was asked for in conjunction with uh, Department of Transportation, uh, NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, and the uh, Veterans Health Administration. So it was actually all three 
who contributed to uh, bringing us together again to, to look at this work. And then finally, um, there's a, a section in the uh, 2012 report that focuses on public engagement, including a public engagement toolkit. Let me conclude my remarks by just highlighting for you the framework that we put together and the focus that we really wanted to emphasize, which is that crisis standards of care really occurs and has to be thought of as a systems framework and that it, we're really talking about a system for catastrophic disaster response. And so what you see before you on this slide is uh, if it looks like the Lincoln Memorial, then you'd be mostly correct. It sort of does look like the Lincoln Memorial. And what it is intended to demonstrate is a, a foundation uh, built upon ethical considerations and the legal authority environment in which these decisions are taken that really are the foundational elements for development of crisis standards of care. And then in the middle of the diagram, you see steps that take you towards um, execution of those, um, of those uh, uh, efforts. Uh, provider engagement is critically important. All of you who are participating with us on the call today, you need to understand and buy into this before we can affect this uh, in the community. Uh, community engagement, we have to include uh, the, the citizens who we serve as willing and equal partners in discussions around these very, very vexing and difficult decisions. Um, we have uh, indicators and triggers that are critically important and clinical processes and operations. And I will highlight for you the fact that all of this has to occur in the context of education, which you see on the left-hand side of the, of the diagram, and information sharing, which really are a part of performance improvement. And, um, and a case in point, you know, performance improvement really suggests that there's a research uh, element uh, and that we're constantly trying to look at what we're doing and, and improve upon what we're doing. And um, the case in point uh, relating to that has to do with, for example, all of the work that has gone into looking at ventilator triage and, um, and uh, the work that, uh, that a number of us uh, uh, have participated in looking at, uh, for example, the use of SOFA scoring, sequential organ failure assessment scoring, which, you know, had it been applied uh, strictly to patients who presented uh, with uh, acute lung injury during H1N1, uh, probably would have killed more patients than we, than, we, than we were able to support. So performance improvement is critically important. And then you see the columns that represent each of the emergency response disciplines. Any one of these columns alone can't do this. Um, it really is a collective effort of the hospitals, public health, uh, the out-of-hospital, private sector, EMS, and emergency management and public safety bounded all under the umbrella or roof of local and state government and ultimately the federal government. So here in one slide really is our system framework, if you will. And um, as I said, you know, what, what we have recommended is really an integration and coordination across all of the emergency response system. And so on this slide and the next slide, you see the recommendation that we put in place um, within the report. Let me conclude by highlighting for you the fact that, that these, uh, these efforts really um, have found their way into, into the grant guidance, into the grant language. And I think much like the way that uh, surge capacity and capability planning has sort of framed uh, a lot of the discussions of the last uh, 10 years or so, my sense is, is that um, the expansion of surge capability and capacity planning in the context of crisis standards of care may, ha may help to frame the next 10 years. Um, and so here from the FEP capability uh, released in 2011, uh, the recognition that there really need to be written plans that, that look at um, you know, the uh, coordination and transition of conventional contingency and crisis standards of care uh, and how this will be done. And in the HPP guidance released earlier this year, uh, very specific recommendations under the medical surge planning uh, area uh, focused on guidance and indicators, legal protections, uh, implementation, um, uh, and um, training uh, around these issues. So, 
So with that said, you know, I know uh, this uh, represents a lot of uh, a lot of work and uh, you know a lot of uh, a, a lot of attention uh, in the context of everything that we're doing. I could leave you with an optimistic uh, note that hey, you know what, it may never happen, and uh, that would be great. I wish I wish I could say that were the case, but um, going back to that first slide that I showed you of catastrophic events in the United States. Um, the fact that we've been as busy as we have been over the last decade, over the last decade, makes uh, the fellow who wears this T-shirt probably, uh, probably in a, a minority opinion, uh, not not likely to be the, um, not likely to be the, the, the fact. So with that, I will uh, stop and turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Hick. That's been Dan Hanfling coming to you live from the Pentagon Briefing Room. Uh, I'm actually coming to you live today from the Swine Barn at the Minnesota State Fair. So what I'm going to try to do is just in the next 15 minutes give you a, a quick 10,000-foot view of uh, some of the issues relating to health systems and crisis care in regards to public health. I want to thank you all for taking some time on your Friday afternoon to uh, be with us and, and listen to this and have an interest in this issue. I know that we may be all that is um, standing between you and happy hour right now, so we'll try to give you some valuable information here. When we talk about uh, crisis standards of care, there is an issue between public health and health care that public health really is a government function. Uh, there's a lot more accountability there and, quite honestly, a lot more authority to act uh, during health emergencies than hospitals and health care have. There also are mass care responsibilities which carry significant um, carry significant implications for uh, the provision of crisis care and crisis medical care. Hospitals are private. Um, they're not directly accountable to government. Uh, sometimes there isn't any responsibility for them to uh, act directly together uh, during an incident. And so public health often is in a role to play the convener uh, in these situations and for these conversations. There's a number of intersections we need to think about, and in particular, uh, public health really stands uh, at the center with the Emergency Operations Center and the other information sources available to it as the definitive source of information for the public as well as for healthcare facilities about the situation, uh, the epidem epidemiology uh, of whatever it is that's going on, providing the risk communication and public information that allows people to know when to seek care, where to seek care, uh, and hopefully uh, provide some balance so that hospitals and clinics are not overwhelmed with people that do not need to be there. They also can provide a significant amount of leverage to help care systems coordinate uh, to be that focal point for emergency service function 8 during a crisis. And as far as provision of clinical care, even though this isn't a primary role of public health, there is definitely a coordination function uh, that public health can play between assuring a degree of medical care from uh, the level of shelters uh, all the way up to the level of ICU care, and also coordinating and, and helping provide the population-based interventions that may prevent uh, people from becoming sick in the first place. There may be a gatekeeper role as far as resource management and resource allocation, whether that's antivirals, N95 masks, uh, or other resources. And there may be a role for policy development or regulatory uh, authority or regulatory uh, rollback for EMS, uh, hospitals, clinics, um, telephone triage and prescribing, and, and other things that may need to come into play during one of these crises. So, we don't expect that everyone's going to sit down uh, with the whole volume here and read cover to cover, but uh, we do think that by taking a look at the templates, which are housed at the, B, at the end of each section, and do provide an overview for the functions that need to occur within uh, each area, this one being the hospital's uh, alerting and notification first page. But if you run through these functions and you're comfortable that those are accounted for within your community, then you're well on your way uh, to have completed some of the planning that needs to be done to make this go easily when something like uh, Hurricane Katrina hits. And it's really that combination of volume and especially loss of healthcare workforce and infrastructure that can combine to put us in a crisis situation. As Dan mentioned, we're uh, operating all the time on that continuum of care that we may be providing conventional care. Contingency care, I just want to say, I think importantly, is the provision of functionally equivalent care that we are maintaining the standard of care. We're just doing it in a little bit different way. So 
the patients you know, who normally might be uh, cared for in a hospital room might be cared for in a same-day surgery uh, environment, uh, that sort of thing. But once we get to the crisis situation, we're not able to provide that functional equivalent care. We need to start shifting to population-based focus, and we may have to make some pretty difficult decisions. That's where coordination with other healthcare facilities really comes into play. So as we move up, and some of you are very familiar with these tiers uh, of responses, which were originally expressed by Barbera and McIntyre, but healthcare facilities need to coordinate with one another, whether that's of their own doing or with public health uh, leverage. That integration then uh, between the healthcare facilities and public health uh, and other agencies needs to occur at the jurisdictional level so that there is resource and patient balancing across the system so that there are not um, sort of islands of overwhelmed you know, hospitals or facilities that are within the community where others have adequate resources. And a lot of this comes down to what is uh, accomplished in the uh, incident management framework. And having a good incident management framework and an understood mechanism for coordinating these things at the facility level as well as the community level, uh, those of you who are familiar with incident management may recognize a lot of similarities between this diagram and the planning P, uh, and that's definitely intentional. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, everyone has thought through, you know, whether it's an agency or an institution, how they will go through this process and make the appropriate adaptations that they need to make for the situation. Because if we don't, the default when we have care normally provided in home environments, uh, in clinics, if those areas of outpatient care are not coordinated and or we don't do a good job with population-based interventions, the pressure always falls back on the hospitals. And that won't work during uh, a major incident and in a crisis situation. We then just wind up uh, further degrading their opportunity to provide appropriate care for those that they have the resources to. So making sure we have release valves for that, we're doing a good job with risk communication, we have the potential to set up alternate care sites uh, flu centers, you know, other means to decompress uh, the hospitals. That's very important. And coordinating that really revolves around the mechanisms that public health must be involved with on uh, the jurisdictional level to figure out what the interface is in your community between the hospitals and the clinic systems, emergency management, emergency medical services, and a lot of times that's a specific multi-agency coordination function, uh, a regional coordination center function. Uh, this is how it happens to be set up in our region, but there's a number of different models at work. It's just a matter of understanding them and practicing them before an event happens. Within that MAC construct, really the goals are to increase system capacity, whether that's hospital, outpatient, uh, to reduce non-emergent care, keep the, the patients that don't need to be in a hospital environment away from the hospital, and provide screening interventions and early treatment at centers before patients get sick. So really that multi-agency coordination is just about getting patients to the right place at the right time. And by doing that, you're managing and balancing resources to assure as consistent regional care as you can and the foundations of that really come back to understanding uh, common ethical frameworks, understanding the legal and liability protections for providers that are out there that James will speak to, understanding and defining state roles and the mechanism for regional coordination, uh, the hospital role within that framework, and whatever your mechanisms are for planning, make sure the operational framework is defined so that when something happens at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're short of ventilator, uh, there is a decision about triaging several patients who are candidates for ECMO. How will those decisions get made? By what process? You know, who do the notifications go out to? And then what are the support tools, the decision tools that can be used in those situations? At the hospital level, there's a number of challenges. So integrating the crisis standards of care into incident management and uh, how that fits within you know, usually the HIC system, recognizing a resource shortfall, what actions get taken, knowing your subject matter experts at the facility and the community that can be brought in to advise, understanding how a triage team would work, whether that's at the facility level or the regional level, and what tools they might use and how those tools are modified to fit the incident, and that's critical. As Dan mentioned, you know, a, a simple you know, SOFA score would not have been uh, an appropriate tool to use for those suffering from isolated respiratory failure from H1N1. 
there's a lot of other considerations from security to um, behavioral health that go into this that need to be addressed within the institution. And then making sure that there is that process improvement, that evaluation of decisions, evaluation of the situation, and then coordination with the outside agencies such as public health. That's all just part of that planning P process and making sure that you're in a rhythm of reassessing and acting uh, and trying to do the best you can based on what happens to be the challenge that day. There's a number of strategies out there. The uh, CHEST articles that Dan uh, had mentioned in one of his slides are certainly a nice resource. There's another one that uh, Minnesota Department of Health has worked hard to put together. If you Google MDH scarce resource, you'll be guided to that card set. Uh, that provides some overall guidance as well as some specific guidance for uh, ventilator triage, for uh, adapting to shortages of oxygen, medications, intravenous fluids, and other things. So you may find that as well as others to be a helpful uh, resource as far as extending the resources that you have as well as making decisions uh, about resources that are in shortage. On the EMS level, again, EMS is provided differently in many different jurisdictions. Sometimes it's a private system, sometimes it's a public system, uh, and there's implications for public health for both. But there are a number of things that need to be done on an EMS agency level to plan for mass casualty situations and particularly what happens in crisis situations. So in a conventional disaster, there may be a need to, say, auto-answer dispatch uh, calls, auto-answer 911 calls that are coming in. By the time you get to crisis, you may be actually declining to send ambulances to certain calls. And the same thing for response and assessment. Uh, instead of shifting in a conventional framework um, who you ask to respond, for instance, on a car accident, maybe the default um, is to just send fire uh, until, uh, until injuries are confirmed. And once you get over to crisis, uh, you're dealing with non-ambulance responses. And even once you get there, deciding that the patient does not need transport to a medical facility, uh, declining to transport, that obviously brings up a lot of liability and, and other issues that need to be addressed before an event like this occurs. So planning with EMS uh, is very, very important, both from uh, the private as well as the public sector. And I'll just mention quickly the issue of alternate care sites. Um, alternate care systems may play a very broad range in helping meet the needs of a catastrophic incident, whether that is medical care that's provided in, in shelter environments, whether that is flu centers for early treatment, whether that is hospital overflow. Um, all of those things have a little bit different requirements as far as staffing and configuration and equipment. Uh, this is a picture of a federal medical station, which are prepackaged, um, essentially hospital overflow or a sort of higher intensity outpatient uh, medical treatment. Um, these are pre-deployed into shelters of opportunity, and the ability to integrate uh, assets such as these into your community response is very important. Alternate care really occurs across a spectrum. Um, and on the left side, many, many patients benefit from very small interventions, such as web-based or telephone triage care all the way over to the right side where if you're missing very specific surgical or intensive care resources, you can uh, bring those in in portable or other fashions to benefit a very small number of patients. And in the middle, we have more of the federal medical stations and shelter medical care. And again, each one of these uh, requires a little bit different approach to planning, which is why this can be very, very challenging uh, for public health and health care. There's issues of authority. Uh, who has the authority to establish these? What are the likely sites? Um, how is transportation accomplished? Are there liability issues? Who provides the supplies and the staffing? And are there reimbursement guidelines for these? Is it going to be funded strictly by time and materials through emergency management, or will the third-party payers agree to pay uh, in these situations? And so mapping out sometimes the roles and responsibilities for these sites can be very, very helpful in determining who will do what because there is certainly not any one right answer as far as what agency or entity should take the lead. And some of this is dependent on the mission as well. So you see here a framework that you know, could be of use in you know, defining the functions first of an alternate care site and then defining primary and secondary agency responsibilities that then can uh, lead to a little bit more effective planning. So we've just scratched the surface from the hospital to EMS to uh, alternate care or outpatient care sites. 
Um, I hope you'll take time to take a look through the functions uh, and read you know, the areas of the report that you feel that there are deficiencies. I hope we provided some good guidance and we'd be happy to continue to provide uh, more detailed support or detailed treatment of some of these areas uh, as desired. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Umer Shah from Harris County who I understand uh, has left Texas for Switzerland and is hiding out uh, from West Nile virus. So we're going to turn it over to Umer in Switzerland. And thanks again everyone for your time. Dr. Shah, are you with us? Hello, this is Bruce Altavo from the IOM. Let me uh, at least start the presentation while we try to reconnect with, with Dr. Shah and hopefully we can get that uh, connection up and running quickly. Um, as as uh, Dr. Hick suggested uh, or introduced him, uh, Dr. Shaw is the Deputy Director from Harris County Public Health and was a member on, on both the committees. He uh, will go to the next slide if I can. I'm actually the third most, he is from Harris County, Texas, which is the third most populous county in the nation with over 4.1 million individuals. Um, his, the main part of his presentation was going to be looking at uh, the role of governments in, in crisis standards of care planning. Um, and we wanted to focus in on the fact that governments at all levels play a crucial role in leading uh, and planning CS and CSC planning and implementation. It's not a state function, it's not only a local function, but it indeed all uh, have, have a role in this. Dr. Char, are you back on? Let me move, keep going. Sorry, everybody. If you go to the next slide, we see that the state government, as defined in the 2009 report, has the ultimate accountability in crisis standards of care planning. They are the, the political and, and constitutional mandate to be prepared. However, local government is also uniquely positioned uh, for the organizational structure. And in, in some cases, it is important that, that the state, that the locals take over um, and help in the planning efforts as, as we move forward. And in the next slide, we, we see that, sorry, if we can go back one slide. We see that um, state and local planning for crisis standards of care, that emergencies are unexpected. They're multi-jurisdictional. And this is a key uh, component of the, the report. And one of the main messages of the report is the multi-jurisdictional nature of these disasters that we're planning for. Therefore, coordination at the state level is critical in moving forward, both at the intrastate and at the interstate level. Um, it requires comprehensive planning, comprehensive coordination at all levels, local, regional, state, and federal. And that states, and another component that was highlighted in the report is that the states also uh, have varied organizational structures and the relationships with local governments Hello? also vary. And because of this, we have to uh, plan accordingly. Is that you, Dr. Shaw? Yeah, that's me. Great. Why don't we? If what, you want to take over? Sure. Where Where are you? Sorry, Bruce. We're at the slide with the um, pie chart showing the variations Perfect. in local Perfect. health. Perfect. Slide number six. Apologize. Yeah, thank you. Apologize, uh, folks. I'm, as, as I guess Bruce mentioned, I'm dialing in from Geneva here and had some problems with my line. Um, but, uh, but thank you. Uh, thanks, Bruce, for tag teaming there. And uh, welcome uh, to everybody. And I apologize for having some troubles from overseas. And the other complicating thing is that I'm having um, trouble with Internet access. I actually cannot see what I'm about to talk about. But I will do my best to continue to uh, be, um, be mindful of uh, moving slides forward or having the slides move forward. So, um, so uh, the slide six really just describes what Bruce 
um, had shown had, had just talked about with variations in state and local health department relationships, and certainly um, there are variations that we're cognizant of, and, and the colleagues uh, uh, that put together uh, the IOM report for crisis standards of care really we we really took um, some additional care in really thinking about centralized structures and decentralized structures, as many of the folks on the call are aware that both in in uh, states across the country there are variations that certainly make it. Um, quite challenging at times to actually have a report that's a, a one-size-fits-all. Next slide. So the role of state governments is really uh, a, a critical one in that decision-making is primarily at the state government level. And James is going to be talking about this right after me, but there are certainly authorities that are at the state level that are very critical and certainly the state plays an integral role in making sure that crisis standards of care are both planned for accordingly but also implemented in a very consistent manner. And so um, we do believe that state health departments, um, though, are best suited at the state level to lead CSC planning and response efforts for a variety of reasons which we certainly go into in our, in our report. States as well have a very critical role in play, interplay with the federal government in both resource support, clinical care guidance, et cetera. And then the regional coordination that I know uh, John um, referred to in terms of RMCCs, RDMACs, and other hospital coalitions. Next slide. So the role of state government, while also critical, it's, it's also critical that the state um, really works very closely with local governments. And I think all the folks on this webinar with ASTO are very aware that state and local governments work very closely together regardless of what kind of structure, whether centralized or decentralized, the structure is within any, any individual state. Um, the role of local government thus is to really be an interplay uh, between what's happening at the state level in terms of planning and response, but also what's happening within the community uh, itself. And so local health departments are the front line of public health agencies and the fulcrum of local CSC response. And so we really, as at the state level, we saw the state health department as being critical. We saw local health department very much integral as well. And Certainly the additional interplay is, is really looking at coordination and collaboration um, both in the local and state um, juxtaposition. So states, next slide, states are obviously at various stages in CSC planning. Some states are more actively engaged and other states have not made as much progress and that was really what the 2009 report uh, to the 2012 report uh, some of the some of the chronology of of uh, our review of what it, where states were really was an important piece to say that states that are more actively engaged we want to say kudos continue the work that's being hap that's that's happening at the at the planning stage which is now and the fact is and and I think this is also integral in all of our presentations is that there's really a duty to plan and so that duty to plan is really inherent now in continuing the CSC work that's already happening in a more engaged state, and also that the local role is very active in that response. And so with the local role being active, we want to make sure that the states and locals are working very closely together. When you move to the implementation stage, the state role is very important in ensuring jurisdictional consistency, which I'll mention in, in just a couple of slides. It also provides two-way communication, situational awareness between state efforts and what's happening on the ground. Next slide. However, we also know that there are states that are less actively engaged thus far in CSC planning. And this can also be considered when you have local health departments uh, that are already further along the CSC spectrum in terms of planning work. So in this case, states really need to begin CSC work now. This is not too hard to do, as one of my colleagues has said. Uh, this is really one of those things that has to be part of planning efforts uh, even now. And so really it's important for states to move the process forward. But if there is really work that's already happening at a local or regional level, we really feel strongly that states should augment and leverage work already started and add to what's already occurring. <laughs> Certainly in the implementation stage, uh, it is equally important for a consistent and coordinated response for states and locals to work closely together. Next slide. So jurisdictional consistency in CSC planning and implementation is very important. And as you can see in this diagram, um, what we really want to say is that as resources become 
uh, decreased in a crisis response as you walk yourself to the right of the diagram from conventional to contingency to crisis care. What we really see is that there is going to be some change in care, and what we are also looking for is to make sure that it, care is as consistent as possible across jurisdictions, and hence the role of the state in being involved in this, so that you don't have forum shopping that's occurring between one jurisdiction having one level or one type of care, whereas another jurisdiction very close by is having a, a very dissimilar level of care that's being provided. Next slide. But it can get complicated. As you can see from conventional contingency to crisis, it blows up very quickly with a number of agencies that come together very, very rapidly. And so, next slide, walking through it can get quite complicated. And I'm not putting a plug in for any, any uh, private sector product here, but I guess fortunately there's an app, I, I mean a template for that. And uh, that's supposed to be a joke. Uh, there's a template for that. Next slide. And so we have a number of templates, as it's already been described by, by Dan and John, in both in, this, in, in, the pre, in all the sections, but definitely in the module for state and local government for plan development, as you can see in template here, 5.1. Next slide. As well as template 5.2, when plan implementation. Next slide. And as you can see back um, a little bit closer with, this, with uh, the round circle here, that tasks one and two in really the planning stage are really critical. And it's very important that folks on this call really take a good look at not just the theory of crisis standards of care, but actually the practice of and the pragmatic approaches that you can take to really move CSC planning forward. So I'm going to now segue into public engagement on crisis standards of care. And really, this is re a very critical piece that IOM recognizes, Dan had mentioned at the beginning of this talk, is that really it's important for us not just to be thinking about ways that we talk to ourselves, but also how do we engage both the public as well as providers. And so in this first slide here, it says, uh, from our 2009 report that we ensure strong public engagement of community and provider stakeholders, especially looking at those that are oftentimes left out of the planning process. Next slide. So public engagement goes from theory to practice. And so our 2012 report for March says that really there's a case for public engagement on crisis standards of care, and it provides a framework defining the essential principles. And then we put together a user-friendly toolkit that we think is really helpful for conducting public engagement activities at the state and local level. Next slide. Public engagement. So the goals, what are the goals? Well, the goals are informing community members about potential need for crisis standards of care, but also for community members to really receive information on how scarce medical resources should be allocated in a CSC type scenario. So it's really a two-way process of understanding both for the community and, and the folks that are involved in as participants, but also for the planners to, to really get the, the viewpoint so that ultimately it ensures CSC guidelines reflect the community's values and priorities. Next slide. So public engagement, really the essential principles are that policymakers seek public input for a variety of reasons. Um, that you want to make sure that there's support and, and resources adequately and they're available to make sure there's a quality process that participants represent the diversity of the community. And this oftentimes means that stipends may need to be used in, in reaching underrepresented populations, et cetera. Um, process should also offer participants meaningful opportunity for deliberation. In other words, this isn't really trying to achieve consensus. This isn't also trying to rubber stamp things. This is really, really, really trying to get to what are those values that are coming from the community. And certainly that policymakers are committed to considering those outputs and, and really can, can give response, uh, participants response back that uh, how, those, how those values, um, that those outputs that came from, from the part, uh, public engagement side, how they can actually be used in final policy decisions. And if they are not going to be used, why they're not going to be used and, and or why they were not used. Next slide. So the benefits are obviously short-term and long-term. In the short-term, there's increased visibility and awareness about the need for CSC guidelines, and there's also really information that's being shared with participants about what state and local governments may be doing already in, in the area of disaster response. But in the long term, it's what I've already said. It's really making sure that the community values are incorporated into the priorities that, that policymakers put forward with CSC planning and response activities. The challenges are to ensure credibility of process. This is the next slide. 
really to ensure that there's meaningful conversation about a difficult topic, that you really are, are bringing people that reflect the diversity of the community, but really that they're having meaningful conversations and are not just being brought together for the purpose of just, well, hey, let's bring them all in one room, but really to have meaningful conversations about difficult, challenging topics. And also, as I've mentioned, allowing the outputs to, um, to be part of the policy making, but also to manage expectations around how the input will be used, as I've mentioned. And then finally, that there are enough resources to initiate and sustain the process, and this is done especially as many in our state and local governments are, are um, dealing with public health priorities in increasingly uh, budget uh, constrained environments, so it's very important that we also make sure that the resources are there. So the toolkit, next slide. Really, we've put forward a model process and a set of tools for community conversations that are based on experiences of various jurisdictions, including Seattle King County, Washington, and Harris County, uh, my health department in Texas, um, and Minnesota, our colleagues in Minnesota. And some of these pictures that you see here are actually some of the public engagement processes that, um, that were used in Harris County. And so really our public engagement toolkit really built upon some of the activities that were happening in various jurisdictions around the country. So we're not starting anew. But at the same time, we also put two pilot pilot uh, engagement conversations in, in Massachusetts, and I had the privilege to lead as, as the facilitator for these two. And I have to be honest, these really brought together a lot of very common themes that, were, that came through many of the different jurisdictional activities that were happening, conversations that were happening at Seattle, Harris County, and in the, Minnesota, in the state of Minnesota. So really what we think that the toolkit has done is really is, is that we've developed it so that state and local jurisdictions then can tailor and adapt the toolkit to, to their needs. Next slide. So the toolkit, and sorry about the busy slide here, and I'm almost done, it includes tools for engaging the lay public in discussions about what values should underlie the allocation of scarce medical resources in disasters. So we have a sample agenda, content slides, facilitator scripts and strategies, survey scenarios, data collection templates, survey questions, and I don't want to sound like a used car salesman, but and much, much, much more. So I really recommend everybody looks at the toolkit. And the toolkit also addresses a number of important questions, which really uh, I'm not going to go through these in, in any great detail, but just to say, well, when we should we do this? How do we engage community partners? What's, uh, how long should this be? Um, how, how do we make the materials in, in, in helpful to participants? And who should be the facilitators? What data, data collection mechanisms should be used? And is this really research or deliberative democracy? Next slide. And so there's a sample scenario. So here is listed our major earthquake. There's also a deadly virus scenario. And we have a couple of agendas, one that's a three to four hour agenda, another that's a six to eight hour agenda, depending on how much time a local or state jurisdiction may have in terms of really figuring out when, um, how, how much time they have to bring participants together. Next slide. We also have sample scenario deliberations. Here's an example of really asking some of uh, participants of, well, how do, you, how do you make decisions when you actually have maybe only age as your criteria and you also have really um, some, some very important considerations in deciding uh, where scarce allocation of resources, how are they going to be approached in a crisis scenario. Next slide. The toolkit then has sample survey questions, as you can see here. And um, I think it's critical that we actually use the um, audience response uh, system, the, some of those clickers uh, that you've seen. Um, but there are a number of different modalities that have been used lately uh, or in other, in other um, uh, forums, such as text messaging and also just not having any technology, but just having people raise their hands or do other things. So we recognize that there are, there are a number of different ways you can do this, but uh, we do think that there are some opportunities of really learning from what others have done. So next slide. So the take-home message is, and this is really from just not just from our Institute of Medicine, but really just the summation of what we were able to review that was out there in terms of what jurisdictions were doing, is that public engagement should, not, should be embraced and should not be feared. I think that's the most important thing, that the public, when, when done well, the public is able to understand challenging com concepts and um, is thoughtful and deliberating despite the complexities. And public engagement can really yield some very important, very tremendously rich and useful information. 
partic participants appreciate the opportunity here as well as, um, and equally important, to be heard. So to hear and to be heard is very critical. And certainly we think and we believe and we, we recommend that the CSC Toolkit um, is, is really a reference uh, guide that provides materials to help facilitate successful public engagement sessions. Next slide. This is contact information for me. And certainly um, if I can answer any other questions about state and local government and public engagement and or public engagement, I will. Hopefully my line doesn't get disconnected from Geneva. Thank you. Dr. Shah, thank you very much. And we will now hear from James Hodge. Well, thank you so much, you Mayor. First of all, it's great to hear your voice from Geneva and glad to have you on board in the end. So listen, I'm at the point where I'm going to take a very brief opportunity for everybody on the call to try to provide just a little bit of perspective about what the committee, as we were developing this report, really found profound, which is the legal issues underlying implementation of a crisis standard of care. Now, I know you all have questions in relation to what you've heard so far. You may have a few in relation to this topic, so I'm going to be very brief. The slides that you'll see here momentarily will all be made available to you. And to be sure, you'll have lots of opportunity for questions, hopefully on this call as well, and in addition, outside of it. So let me, just, let me just sort of touch base on what I want to try to communicate ever so briefly in the time that we'll take here just for a few more moments. First of all, when you look at the Crisis Standard of Care report, there's a section on the legal implications. It is, I think, quite uh, illustrative. It's written for the layperson. You don't need your legal attorney to read it with you to get what we're talking about. And you'll see it goes into a lot of detail on some very specific issues, including a very helpful table. I just want to drill down on three. So today let's just talk about three critical things you're probably already thinking about in the implementation issues underlying any crisis standard of care. What's this actual legal environment during emergencies? How do we kind of think this through? What about and how do we regulate health professionals? What are the issue, issues related to licensure and scope of practice concerns? Then the big one, the one we heard, heard a lot about in relation to developing the standard, what about liability issues? So to that front, let's continue on and see just how we can break through and kind of think about these issues from a legal perspective. One thing that's absolutely true is how pervasive law is in emergency responses. Laws pervade every level of government in regards to their emergency preparedness and response efforts. They, they determine what constitutes a public health or other emergency. It's law that creates the infrastructure through which emergencies are detected, through which we can prevent them and address them. Laws authorize you and others to do certain things or to not do certain things during emergency responses, and they determine the extent of responsibility or liability for actual or potential harms that arise during emergencies. It's this concept of law coupled with the various levels of government that come together, especially in major catastrophes, working through a whole host of partners and a whole bunch of different actors from public health to private health care workers and such, that creates this environment or this status that I like to call legal triage. We've been referring to what and how we might provide medical triage in a lot of settings. Lawyers and, law and policymakers are working behind the scenes as well to address a whole host of legal issues. I like to define this term legal triage in a way that gives us a little something to grab onto and understand what's going on behind the scenes. It's when the, you have these efforts of legal actors and others to sort of construct a favorable legal environment. It's critical that we can do this during emergencies. And the way we do it is we're prioritizing critical issues, we're developing solutions, and we're trying to do the very best we can to do like Dan Hambling was talking about, facilitating public health responses to a major crisis, not just looking at it from an individualized healthcare perspective. Now towards this end, how do we do this? Well, legal actors and others, this is not just the role of attorneys, but others, we're all working in real time during these events to assess and monitor changing legal norms, particularly related to declared emergencies, to identify those sort of legal issues that are facilitating or impeding public health responses, to develop innovative and hopefully responsive legal solutions, things that work to facilitate the response efforts. We've got to explain those conclusions in you know, very uh, simplistic language so that people can use them and work with them. And then you do that once, that's fine. Do it again the next day and the next day. You've got to consistently revisit the utility, the efficacy, and the ethicality of that type of legal guidance. Why is this so essential 
what are we doing in building this legal environment? It's essential that we do this through legal triage because once an emergency is declared, the legal landscape as we know it, it changes, and it can change drastically. But that depends on the type of part of, of the type of the emergency that's been declared, whether it's a Hurricane Katrina-like event, the California wildflower or wildfires, or uh, particularly a pandemic-like event. As you see in this specific slide and illustration, as you probably know, every level of government, from international to federal to state to local, has some capacity in many jurisdictions to declare some type, some type of, of emergency or public health emergency or disaster response. It's particularly at the state level that we tie the crisis standard of care, right? Because the state might be in control of licensure, might be in control of liability determinations. So when the state declares that emergency, as did Louisiana in response to Hurricane Isaac, in also declaring a public health emergency in response to the same event. That's what triggers some of what we're talking about. But all these other emergency declarations are all working to change how we respond in real time. This slide gives you a little bit of illustration of that. Depending on the type of emergency that you're responding to, be it local, state, federal, or some sort of international protocol, the public health and healthcare authorities, the powers, the liabilities you may be subject to, your immunities to those, other critical legal issues, they depend on that emergency declaration, and they will vary based on that. So just one example of this, of, among many different types of approaches, is kind of how we laid out some of these key powers in the Emergency Health Powers Act, an act that you'll see in a moment is proliferated across the country. When you declare a public health emergency under this model act uh, that was drafted and developed in 2001 following 9-11, you really are doing some different things. You're bestowing individuals with special entitlements and special protections. You're changing the licensing and credentialing requirements. You can effectively waive them pursuant to that type of declaration. Volunteers and others may be protected from civil liability. They would not be in a non-emergency event, but they would in this. Governments vested with very specific expedited powers to respond. These are effective techniques, all designed to change the legal landscape so that we can effectuate crisis standard of care more, uh, uh, more beneficial. Here are just those jurisdictions, for example, the 26 that actually formally allow for the statute declarations of public health emergency. And like I say, it was used in Louisiana just recently this past week. So let's just talk for a second about the critical issue of health professionals. You know, for example, when we're talking about providing crisis standard of care you will be working with a lot of different health professionals, some of which will need to come from outside that jurisdiction, that influx and flow of volunteer health professionals into a specific event setting is critical if we're going to be able to respond in real time. But you can't pull that off legally unless you have emergency declarations doing, like I say, waiving the licensure requirements for out-of-state personnel to be able to step in and provide care immediately. The effect of these emergency laws is to say, we view your good standing out-of-state license as if it was issued in-state for the duration of the emergency declaration. That's exactly what Louisiana did. And then, of course, compacts like emergency management assistance compact, the agreements like the nurse licensure compact can accomplish these very same things. Just because you've waived licensure doesn't mean that you've set the scope of practice. And this is quite critical as well. Legally, could you, for example, allow a nurse to perhaps exceed her scope of practice, things that she or he may not be you know, necessarily authorized to do in a non-emergency, can you change that? In a non-emergency, as you know, no, it's not easy. It's going to be potentially a licensure and sanction to do that. During an implementation of a crisis standard of care in a formally declared emergency, there's every opportunity to do that to some degree, especially with certain volunteers. We can work with changing this practice at the state level, and just so long as they provide the care consistent with how the states change that scope, it's legit. It's legally sound. What about liability? This is the critical one that we hear so much about. We're referring here to the potential responsibility that a person or an entity or an institution like a hospital may owe for their actions or their failures to act for that matter, result in injury or losses to others. Who can be liable? Anybody can be liable in an emergency response effort. Your healthcare workers, your volunteers, sure. Healthcare entities, hospitals, clinics, employers, yeah, go for it. 
persons or entities responsible for emergency responses, you know, governmental entities and such, yeah, can they be liable? There's a way to find that. How do we work that through in real-time events to mitigate some of that potential liability? Well, the first technique is we switch to a crisis standard because for all intent and purposes, that means we can legally switch to a sort of different standard that allows us to recognize these practitioners and others are not operating under standard protocol. They've switched to the crisis, and that's exactly what we're expecting happens. But as this slide illustrates here, we're trying to show there's a couple paths to accomplishing some sort of mitigation of liability concerns because this is a major concern among virtually every healthcare practitioner as well as volunteers especially. Path one says, well, let's just follow what you've heard already. We'll assess liability based on whether we're in conventional care, contingency care, or whether we've issued an emergency declaration and thus have a crisis standard. That's good, but it doesn't keep you out of court. It can get you hauled in just like happened to Dr. Anna Powell. So the next path might be to say, hey, even as liability risks are increasing, the use of volunteers is increasing, the patient numbers are increasing, and we're having decreases in resources and employed personnel that are available as well as potential malpractice liability coverage. You know, path two says, let's do something about that statutorily. Let's create enhanced liability protections that apply right here. That's exactly what you're seeing across the United States federal, state, local governments providing literally an umbrella of liability coverage meant only for the emergency, meant to apply to protect those healthcare workers that are doing things within the scope of what they're there to do, certainly not acting in a criminal way or an unlawful sort of manner. But these various protections include, you know, strong governmental sovereign immunity that can be applied even to private healthcare workers at times. Good Samaritan Acts have limited application, but some ways do. Volunteer Protection Acts are in place at the federal and state level. The PREP Act will come into play here at the federal level and can provide extensive liability protection and even entity liability protections for hospitals and others involved. These are all possible. They're only possible because of the declared emergency in most cases, and they apply to specific actors differently. But to be sure, this is the liability environment that we've chosen from a statutory and policy perspective in the United States. We will protect workers and hospitals and others engaged in crisis standard care when possible. You may have other questions. I hope you do. You let us know about those on the legal front. We can handle these through our network for public health law. Contact us in the Western Region office. Contact me directly. Special thanks to my colleagues. And I think I'll turn it back over now to um, our moderator for additional questions and thoughts. Thank you. Great. James, again, thank you. And to Dan, John, James, Umar, and, and Bruce. Thank you for such an outstanding, um, you know, inf informative um, presentation. Uh, before we open it up for conversations and, and looking at some of the notes that came in, um, I do want to mention to everybody that the audio of this webinar, as well as the 105-part um, slide deck, will be made available to all participants. It will be put up on the ASTA website, and I also understand that it will be available through the Institute of Medicine's website as well. So both the slide deck of the presentations and the audio and the speaker's bios will be made available as soon as possible. So with that, Cersei, could I ask you to open up the line for audience participation who wants to make statements, questions, and begin a conversation? Certainly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. Again, to register for a question, please press 1-4. One, one moment, please, for the first question. And there are no questions from the phone lines at this time. Well, while they are thinking of questions, um, let me present one to, to James. Um, in your, your, your presentation, uh, clearly the, um, the, evolving, the evolution of the, on the continuum to a crisis seems to be sort of the, the, the dominant theme or focus point. But there is a question in my mind, and, I, and possibly others, about um, the legal frameworks and the li liability protections when you're in a um, contingency um, 
phase of the of the the continuum when you're when, when you're sort of transitioning from conventional to crisis you're sort of in that in that uh, get gray zone in between where you're not declaring um, a declaration of emergency, but yet um, sort of conventional standard practices are are being modified out of necessity. Um, how does the framework and how does that fit into your presentation as far as what what legal concerns or li liability protections need to be considered? It's a great point, Jim, because you know one of the critical things you have to understand and think through as you see back on the slide here is that you know our focus. For the, for the purposes of the legal environment here is on when we actually do have a crisis standard, and thus the emergency declaration triggers the sorts of protections and environment that I'm discussing here. What's so great to note is this contingency care, as John and Dan have mentioned, you know, things are changing already consider, uh, based on sort of the contingency care, the sort of lead-up care you may have to do or the sort of things that you know you're going to have to anticipate. The best thing I can say in regards to this from a legal perspective is that what you'll see in many jurisdictions like you saw in Louisiana this past week is they will sort of early declare a public health emergency before all of the specific uh, critical powers may be needed, or even if they're not needed, they'll, they'll declare it in advance to kind of prepare for that exact issue. So as a result, what you may see on this continuum is this. while the emergency declaration will always kind of follow some of the initial efforts for contingency care, it may come earlier than you think so that we can trigger all of the typical liability protections and other things that come into play, including the licensure reciprocity provisions. To be sure, though, you identified it as a gray zone. It's a very apt up response because that's exactly what it can be for a short period while we anticipate literally government acting to declare the emergency. Thank you very much. Cersei? Thank you very much. Our first question comes from the line of Beth McKinney. Please proceed with your question. Hi, this is Suzette McKinney from Chicago. Hi, Jim. Um, hey, how my are you? question is for uh, Mr. Hodge with regard to the umbrella of protection that you talked about, uh, the liability protection, and specifically, yes, this slide, specifically, um, what your thoughts are about governmental, you know, regulatory um, approaches to providing this coverage. I mean, is this something, obviously this is something we want to see happen nationwide, but the planning is really going to start at the local level moving up to the state level. So where do you see, which level of government, I should say, do you see this liability coverage um, starting? I can't see it as being something that the federal government passes that, will help all of us. I see it more as a, you know, local um, regulations, perhaps then moving towards state regulations, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so that's a great series of observations, and I can assure you in some jurisdictions with considerable home rule at the local level, and home rule, as you all may know from a legal perspective, just means local government's got the authority to actually enter into and to create specific provisions. You know, in larger cities, Chicago size and other places, you'll see the sort of attempt to create some sort of uh, liability protection within those limited circumstances. But to be perfectly honest, this is a state policy initiative. And in most jurisdictions, that's where you're seeing almost all the work be done is at the state level. Now, the feds have done some very significant work, like, for example, in the declaration of the federal or the creation of the Federal PrEP Act. That's really good liability protection when you're implementing countermeasures in the pandemic response type of effort. And there's, of course, the Federal Volunteer Protection Act. It's a little bit of a patchwork, Beth, but what I do want to assure you is that when you systematically look at the liability protections for emergency responders in the healthcare arena across this country, you're hard-pressed to not find some avenue for protecting these persons because it has become a predominant policy approach to actually provide some type of liability protections for these healthcare workers and hospitals and others that are you know, literally being scripted into an emergency response effort in impl implementing crisis standard, for example. So it's become a predominant policy approach. You can find it in a lot of states. The feds have not done a systematic across-the-board liability protection act. You're probably not going to see that. We've seen lots of attempts. They've all failed. There's reasons for that. But what you do see is a very substantial patchwork that I think constitutes a pretty strong umbrella of liability coverage. 
Great. Suzette, thank you for that question. Next. Just wanted to. This is John Hick. I just wanted to chime in on uh, the tail end of that and, and just mention that a lot of the decisions and uh, a lot of the um, planning that we do ahead of the necessity for these legal uh, interventions or these legal decisions is really what the report is all about. It's about staying out of uh, crisis situation. It's about trying to anticipate and uh, you know make the decisions and manage the incidents so that we don't get to that point. And there's no question that in especially that reactive phase, that, that triage decisions, that crisis care is going to get provided before uh, there are formal legal or other declarations in place. Uh, that's just the reality of, of what's going to happen on the ground. But uh, it's in our best interest to make sure that there is support from a uh, governmental standpoint, regulatory, uh, legal, and otherwise, uh, for those efforts going on uh, in the facilities and uh, in the other places where care is being provided. Excellent point. Thank you, John. Other questions? Okay, our next question comes from the line of Jane Hooley. Please proceed with your question. Hi, it's Jane Cooley from Buffalo, New York. I was wondering, um, I think you addressed this a little bit earlier about printing the slides, but is there a, a website that you go to do that, or is there a cost for it, or how does that work? Sure. The the website, the the, um, the PowerPoint presentation will be made available free of charge, and it can be found on both the IOM and the ASTO websites. So for ASTO, it's um, www.astho.org. And Bruce, if you're on the line, if you can share with the audience where they could find it on the IOM web website. Yep, that's, it's as simple as yours. It's www.iom.edu. The easiest will be um, actually just doing a Google search for IOM and uh, crisis standards of care, and that will get you to the appropriate page within the IOM. Um, we should hopefully have the slides up uh, by Monday or Tuesday, and, and certainly I'm sure I'm speaking for Jim also, there is no cost associated. Um, on the IOM page, you can download the complete report, uh, individual volumes of the report, um, as well as the uh, public engagement templates and other uh, associated materials, and that's all free of charge. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I ask a, another question about that? The toolkit is that uh, is that a separate thing, or is that in the report? Because it seemed like a, a prudent thing to have al along with the slides. Yeah, this Sorry, is the Mayor the Shaw. Toolkits are the toolkits that uh, Dr. Shaw mentioned in his presentation. Um, and are meant to help uh, facilitate the public engagement process. And then all of the templates that are uh, that have been mentioned in the uh, presentations today to help in the planning and implementation uh, part of this activity are also available for individual download through uh, the IOM project site. Uh, thanks, yeah, Bruce. Okay. This is Umer. This is Umer Shah. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, can you hear me? Sure. Oh, yeah, yes, great. I just wanted to real quick just say that w with respect to the toolkit, uh, definitely uh, one of the questions that we've gotten a lot is about the the agenda and, and including uh, some of the content slides. And so that is, as Bruce has mentioned, is part of the toolkit. So you can actually um, pull off the really the sample um, uh, content slides, if you will, for public engagement and really how, how we put things together, but also really to, to help uh, some of the planners really think about what are some of the considerations when you're really working with the community or with participants who come in who may not really know anything. This is really de novo work for them uh, for the first time concepts that they may not be aware of. And so that certainly is part of the toolkit as well. And those slides are, as Bruce mentioned, as part of the, the report itself as, as the public engagement module. That sounds wonderful because it, cause I think I'm a, a regional emergency preparedness coordinator in Buffalo, New York, and uh, an RNBS and retired uh, colonel on the Army Nurse Corps. So uh, it, it seems like a good thing to do, and uh, we have a great local and state type thing and emergency preparedness people uh, and meetings, and everything's good. But I think it takes it. We'd like to take it to the next level about what you're talking crisis standard of care. Uh, so that they can get involved in this because it sounds like a very good program as well. And just as an aside to uh, 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 Mr. Hodge, uh, being in the military in Desert Storm and a few things, we didn't have to worry about the legality of what we did because the government would protect us. But I can see where 
it's good to look into the protection of just regular civilian type people that help in these kind of crises. Yeah, that's a good point. Not everybody enjoys the protections that federal agents do, and to be sure, uh, there's a lot of private healthcare workers doing a lot of great work in these events. Yes. Yep. Excellent points. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, Cersei, other questions or comments? Uh, the last question comes from the line of Dennis Tomsick. Please proceed, sir. Yes, thank you. Yeah, the question comes about your use of the term standard of care in crisis standards of care. There's some discussion about you know, the very fact that the definition of the standard of care is that the reasonable practitioner does what he would reasonably do given the circumstances. So there's been some question about whether this is really the appropriate word for crisis standards of care. Do you have any comment or clarification about that? Uh, yeah, so this is Dan Hanfling, and then I'll, I'll ask uh, James to, to follow. But, uh, you, know, um, you know, we've heard this comment, and we've heard this sort of discussion, and frankly, to be honest with you, I think it's, um, it's a conversation that we ought to just zip up and, and do away with. Um, I, I think it's seen its, its day. And, you know, as I stated in the beginning, what really we have defined here is – an extension on a systems approach to surge capacity and capability planning and response. And uh, to get hung up just on the word of, you know, standard of care or crisis standard of care, I think is to miss basically the forest for the trees. Uh, and, and so to take you back to, to the evolution of that um, phraseology, you know, what we really are defining here is a continuum of surge response uh, that develops, a, you know, across that continuum, uh, and, and with that response is a concomitant standard of care, if you will. Now, there's no question it is related to the situation at hand. Uh, but um, as James Hodge very eloquently uh, described, there are certain things that are going to occur in a catastrophic event where there are resource limitations and staffing shortages and a, 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 an extreme uh, run on demand for healthcare services in which the situation is so different that just to call it the situation at hand, uh, you know, can be done. But what we, have, what we have decided is to really say we really link that to the surge response that's occurring. Um, so let me let me ask James just to to uh, add his uh, uh, input on, on this issue, and then uh, we'll turn it back to you. Yes, and I'll be very brief, Dan. That was very eloquent. I think highly consistent with what and how this committee worked through this particular very pivotal question. But the one point I'll throw into it from a legal perspective that has got to be recognized is what Dan mentioned much earlier. When and the slide that you see on your screen really emphasizes in a typical standard of care, delivery of health services is focused on your individual patients. That's a great thing. I mean, that's how we assess that in a legal setting. We say, well, okay, did this particular patient get what was consistent with the typical care a reasonable practitioner would provide and all that typical language? In a crisis standard, we are switching to a population health approach. There is simply not a recognition legally for some of how we might do this. A formal declaration makes that possible. And legally speaking, from a pure policy perspective, it makes it clear that there are decisions being made that might not always advance a particular patient's interest, but do advance the population's interest. These are tough, critical allocation decisions. They will be made and have to be made in, in these major emergencies and the law will respect that more based on a recognition of a crisis standard type of event. Dennis, this is uh, John Hick. Nice to hear from you. I just want to chime in that, you know, as, as Dan said, this really is a half of 1% uh, of the report and of the myriad legal and regulatory issues that enter into these events. You know, the, the issue of provider liability is one component. If providers are convinced by the arguments that, um, you know, that they are protected uh, under those sort of usual terms of the application of the legal term standard of care, then, then that's really up to them in their particular states. I will say that in our 
regional workshops, it was loud and clear from the providers that they had substantial concerns, especially where they were having to make structured triage decisions for which there is absolutely no legal precedent and, and therefore they didn't take much comfort uh, in the fact that there hadn't been any legal precedent in those areas. Great. An excellent culminating conversation, so thank you all for that. Uh, unfortunately, our time together this afternoon has come to an end. But before we adjourn, um, you know, let me take the liberty of sort of uh, inviting or allowing our five presenters uh, to have the, the final say, if you will. If there are any um, final messages or points of clarification the five panelists would like to share with us, um, just allow me to sort of provide that opportunity to you right now. Uh, Jim, uh, Dan Hansling, I, I will say that uh, I don't know uh, if all of the attendees are able to follow the chat as well. There was an excellent chat question regarding the importance of, of regional coordination and uh, not just intrastate regional but interstate regional coordination. And, uh, and I think that that's another area that really deserves further attention and ultimately you know, re is going to require state-to-state -state coordination, governor-to-governor -governor coordination. Uh, but I just wanted the attendees to be aware that that, that point had come up in the course of um, the chat discussion. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for raising that. Any others? Jim, this, Jim, this is Umair. I just wanted to add one other thing is that um, as we've been working on both state and local um, government roles but also in the public engagement piece, we really have uh, done our best with the toolkit to, to move forward principles of how to engage the, the lay public. Uh, one of the areas that we're also working um, and, and perhaps have not made as much progress thus far is really provider engagement. And so I think it's really critical that we bring to the table and that the folks on the webinar are aware that both public engagement can include providers, healthcare providers, um, but healthcare providers can also be a separate, um, very different uh, group of folks to really engage. And it's critical that we actually bring our healthcare providers to the table as well so that mm -hmm. they can also understand the concepts but also be able to, you know, to really uh, be, you know, be real champions of uh, crisis standards of care and the work that you know, we're all trying to get accomplished. So I just wanted to bring that up. That, that's really an area that we are continuing to, to look for avenues on how do we, how do we enhance that, those efforts. Great, you know, an excellent point of sort of you know, increasing the ability to uh, more appropriately inform future policy and practice decisions. So Umar, thank you very much for, for raising that. Last call for, for comments from the panel. Just one quick one for me, James Hodge here in Arizona. If anybody didn't get a question answered, let us know. We'll look yes. forward to address that furthermore. Yes. That, that's a commitment um, from all of us. So again, thank you all very much. So for the audience, please join me um, in, our own, in your own special way through this virtual environment in thanking um, our five panelists today for providing an extremely informative um, and somewhat provoking, uh, provoking conversation uh, on the issue of the framework for crisis standards of care. Um, so that concludes today's webinar. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we will certainly provide to you all um, the audio and the PowerPoint slide deck uh, on the two websites previously mentioned. So, and we also are quite confident that in the months ahead there will be other opportunities um, to discuss this with, with the authors, the researchers, the experts, and the practice community. Uh, I'm sure this, this, um, this activity will be uh, a showpiece for the upcoming uh, Preparedness Summit in March of 2013. And I'm sure there are other um, events that the preparedness community are planning in the upcoming months that will give us, again, ad additional opportunities to learn a little bit more about um, the toolkits uh, and how best to apply it. So again, thank you all very much. Um, have a safe and enjoyable weekend, and I'm sure we will be in touch. And that concludes today's conference. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.